Their son did the shooting, allegedly. So why are the parents on the run? It could have something to do with four counts of involuntary manslaughter and an angry prosecutor who says what the parents didn't do was criminal. And then just when you thought the week had gotten the best of you, proof that family values still reign on social media. A loving young family that knows how to rock out with millions of fans around the world. The Clark family is live on Banfield tonight. Hello and welcome to Banfield. We are coming up on 10 hours. Yes, 10 since a Michigan prosecutor took the very rare step of announcing criminal charges against those parents, the parents of the alleged school shooter in Michigan. And now we're coming up on six hours since the deadline came and went for those parents to turn themselves in. And right now, in the eyes of the law, these two people take a good long look, James and Jennifer Crumbly. They are fugitives and they are being sought by the police but not just the police, also by U.S. Marshals, also by the FBI. And if you can believe this, you can be of help here because they issued a BOLO. That's a be on the lookout. That's in effect for the Crumblies. And again, if you can believe it, police say, careful, keep your distance, because these folks could be armed and dangerous. When they do decide to reappear, the couple is gonna face at the very least four counts of involuntary manslaughter. One for each of the high school students, their son Ethan allegedly gunned down on Tuesday using a pistol that his dad had just bought for earlier on four days prior. Details of that gun purchase were spelled out today in a news conference that I'm not gonna lie here, folks, kind of made my jaw drop. It also made my blood boil. Really like no other prosecutor's news conference that I can remember. And honestly, I've covered thousands of these things. So pour a drink and buckle up because I'm going to give you uh, the highlights, which really are lowlights. Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald, that's her at the podium. She said that on November 26th, dad, James Crumbly, went along with Ethan, 15 years old, and bought a 9mm Sig Sauer handgun from Acme Shooting Goods in Oxford. That's the town where they live. James bought that gun in his own name. Ethan, you know, 15 years old, he's a minor. So Ethan, he's not allowed to own one. So James put it in his name. But the very next day, that 15-year-old was posting this. This is Ethan's Insta saying, hey, just got my new beauty today, Sig Sauer, nine millimeter. Any questions? I will answer. Separately, mom was also busy on Soch, posting this. Mom and son day, testing out his new Christmas present. Did you catch that? His Christmas present. At this point, I'm just gonna go ahead and interject that Buying a firearm for someone who is not allowed to buy a firearm for himself, like a 15-year-old kid, well, that there is a federal crime. Makes you a straw purchaser. Makes you a criminal. That hasn't happened yet. Stay tuned for the feds. But a few days before he even had that gun in his teeny little fat hands at 15, Ethan was spotted by a teacher searching for ammo on his cell phone at school. You have kids in school, you know right then and there, those words, they just don't go together. Searching for ammo on your cell phone at school? No, you're not even allowed to talk about it, let alone search for it. So the school did what they were supposed to do. They left a voicemail for Ethan's mom. Hey, your, ki your kid's searching for ammo. That's a problem, you need to call us. But she didn't. So they did the next thing they had to do. They followed up with an email. Mom ghosted them. Didn't bother getting back to them on that really, really important topic. She did, however, take the time to send this text to Ethan. LOL, I'm not mad at you. 
you have to learn not to get caught. I just want you to feast your eyes on that for a moment. Let that sink in. LOL. <laughs> That's funny. I'm not mad at you. You have to learn not to get caught. P.S. Jennifer Crumbly, I want to take that advice yourself. Maybe you did take that advice yourself because you haven't been caught tonight and there's a bolo out for you and your husband. On the morning of the rampage itself, November 30th, school officials contacted the Crumblies yet again. And this time, I don't know why, but they actually decided to come to the school. And the issue was a note that was seen on Ethan's desk. He had drawn a handgun, pointing at the words, the thoughts won't stop, help me. There was also a drawing of a bullet with the words, blood everywhere. And a person with two gunshot wounds was drawn next to a laughing emoji. And then he wrote the words, my life is useless. The world is dead. You still with me? So you can understand, right? Perfectly rational that the Crumblies were asked to take Ethan home. <laughs> and they were told, not asked, told to get him into counseling. And they had 48 hours to do it. 48 hours get that kid into counseling. What did the Crumblies do? They did not take that child home. They refused. That's what the prosecutor said today. The Crumblies just refused to take that kid home. So what happened to Ethan? School took him back to class with his backpack. Back to class. Here you go. This is the scene three hours later. He allegedly pulled his brand new Sig Sauer pistol out of that backpack that neither his parents nor the school officials ever bothered to search. And the shooting began. 31 minutes later, that's when the news got out that there was an active shooter. Mom texts her boy saying, Ethan, don't do it. Just minutes after that, dad decides to call 911 saying that his gun was missing. Dad's gun. Now it's dad's gun, apparently. And it's missing. And then he goes on to say that he thinks that Ethan might actually be the Oxford High School shooter. So remember when I said my jaw dropped and remember when I said I've covered thousands of these news conferences, but man, was I pissed at this one. I want to bring in my guests, but before I do that, I did mention that this prosecutor was also pretty angry. And that's not my word, that's hers. And it is not reserved solely for the crumblies. I want you to hear her response, the prosecutor, to a reporter's question about anger in that community of Oxford towards the school over steps that the school might have taken but didn't. I'd be angry too, and I am. But that doesn't mean that there's a criminal um, culpability. But yes, I'd be angry. I would be angry. I am angry. I'm angry as a mother. I'm angry as the prosecutor. I'm angry as a, a, a person in, that lives in this county. I, I'm angry. There, there were a lot of things that could have been so simple to prevent. And yes, there was. I'm angry. I'm angry. Listen, maybe you were at work today. Maybe you were out walking the dog, picking up the kids at their school, where they're hopefully safe on Monday. Um, but if you weren't angry when you watched that news conference and you heard those details, I'd... I'd suggest you check for a pulse. I want to mention something else. Uh, you might have heard this. Ethan lawyered up right after the shooting, right away. Um, so they couldn't get any information from Ethan. And guess who else has lawyered up? Jennifer and James Crumbly. Their lawyer is now insisting that these two, they're not <laughs> fugitives. What? They're just lying low, you know for their own safety. That's quote, for their own safety. And here's another quote, they're returning to the area. It's good to see they're worried about their safety. It's good to see they're proactive, you know, about their safety. They're proactive about their safety. 
I don't know if they're proactive about other people's safety, but they're being proactive about their safety. How about that? How about that? Those are the crumblies. And it's Friday, and they missed their 4 o'clock turn in. So I don't know what they have planned for the weekend. But I don't think things are going to go well for them when they finally decide to crawl out from whatever rock they're hiding under. Joining me now, attorney and legal analyst Darren Cavanoke. You know him from his series, Deadly Sins, on investigation discovery. And from Volusia County, Florida, Sheriff Mike Chitwood. You know him from Live PD. All right, guys, you're going to have to spend this Friday night getting me off the ledge because I am angry. And I know I'm not the only one who is angry. Cavanoke, I'm going to start with you. Because for involuntary manslaughter counts, yeah, I kind of think that's the least of what you can go after them for. But now there's this whole business of them running on empty. So what do you think they could face because of this little business today? Well, certainly with the manslaughter charges, we're talking about gross negligence in order to be convicted of involuntary manslaughter, which requires more than mere ordinary negligence. It's a willful, wanton disregard for the safety of others and a failure to act to, to take reasonable steps to prevent a foreseeable harm. Uh, but to your point about there being fugitives, certainly that would show consciousness of guilt. Flight is something that can be introduced at their trial to show awareness of the wrongfulness of their conduct. And certainly yeah, I more feel than like just it's the consciousness criminal case. of guilt too, right? What is this lawyer though, Kavanoki? This lawyer saying to the pro they've been in negotiation since last night. The prosecutor just took it on good faith that the lawyer was telling them the truth when the lawyer said, "My clients will be in tomorrow before the four o'clock arraignment." What, what's up with the? Is the lawyer in trouble now? Is the lawyer going to cut bait and say, "Thanks, you're risking me my license." Well, it's, it's really not that uncommon for lawyers to arrange a voluntary surrender in, in cases where, uh, where it's appropriate. Um, th this, however, is a remarkably different situation, and certainly the fact that they didn't surrender as promised uh, creates a whole new set of problems for them. Boy, I'll say. Okay, Sheriff Mike Chitwood, I just had to hear what you have to say about all of this. I, I've been sort of dying to talk to you all week, and then today happened, and I thought I better get him on speed dial. Actually, I'm on the ledge with you, and thank God for this prosecutor. I, I think her statement of, as a prosecutor, a lawyer, and a mom, I have to do this. Those text messages, it, 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 this just defies logic. It, it defies decency. It defies everything that we stand for as parents and Americans. It, it's just a sickening. And I, and I can't sum it up any other way than that. And as a law enforcement officer, Sheriff, I put that quote up on the screen and I read it twice for good measure. Because to me, I think this is what could hang this woman. Uh, LOL. I'm not mad at you. You have to learn how not to get caught. So, Sheriff, as a law enforcement officer, I can only imagine that that makes you double down and say, oh, oh, really? Because we can really investigate. We, we, there are lengths we can go to to look at every single text you've ever sent, if that's the kind of business you think is appropriate. Well, they're trying to practice what they're preaching in the fact that they have gone rogue on everybody, withdrawing the money, disappearing, they knew, I believe in my heart, they knew that it was going to, what was going to happen. It happened. The fact that the gun was reported stolen 27 or 37 minutes after this attack occurs, her texting her son, don't do it after this attack occurs. It, 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 it's just unbelievable. It, it just defies logic. I mean, I'm on the ledge with you. Yeah, it defies logic. Uh, I'm not mad at you. You just have to learn not to get caught. I feel like if there's anything, Darren, that's going to make her uh, stick to these charges and struggle oh. to defend, uh, it's going to be that statement. Oh, if you're if you're a prosecutor in this case, that statement is blown up on a board and is going to be in front of that jury uh, for an extensive period of time. It really shows that. so much about the kind of parenting that went on in that household and certainly the the parents 
culpability that they had no regard for the safety of others. And that's, that's okay. really where parental liability for the child's criminal activity comes into play. It, 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 that's how I feel. And, and then I keep sort of going back to this meeting at the school that morning where they say, you got to take that kid out of here and you got to put him into counseling within 48 hours. That's the rule. And they uh, balked at that. And they said, we're not. The, the prosecutor said they refused. I want to play something here that I think is really important from Karen McDonald, this prosecutor. Uh, she was like, holding nothing back. Uh, it was like daggers coming out of her mouth uh, at that podium today. But this one was with regard to the investigation not being over, that there could be other people who are a part of this for culpability. And I immediately went to school. They, 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 they sent him back to the classroom. Mm -hmm. They didn't call the police and say, get him out of here. The, the, the parents won't, but cops, you got, you got to come. And this is what she had to say about that particular question. Have a listen. I'm not going to give you a political answer, and I'm not going to cover it for anybody, and I'm just going to say what I think, and that is, of course he shouldn't have gone back to that classroom. Of course he shouldn't have. And, and I, I don't have um, ill feelings or negative feelings about any, anyone, and I, I, but of course he should have. He should not have been allowed to go back to that class. Any individual who had the opportunity to stop this tragedy should have done so. The question is, what did they know, and when did they know it? So Darren Kavanoki, it's a, an image I conjure up a lot in cases where I see, okay, maybe there's no criminal exposure here. I don't know, maybe there is. But should that school district buy themselves a wheelbarrow from Home Depot and load a ton of money into it and then drive it to the families of the four dead children and the families of the seven others who were injured. Well, and even more than that, all of the student body were affected by this, being forced to go through that traumatic event. And there's no doubt in my mind that there's going to be a large number of civil lawsuits that are filed in this case, both against the, the parents, their homeowners insurance, the school, uh, yes, get that wheelbarrow, get that checkbook out. It's going to certainly be an expensive proposition for them because they I really think, had um, the opportunity to, to stop this, to, to take intervening measures, to push back when the parents say, no, we don't want to take him out of school. Let's send him back to class. Well, the answer is no, he's not allowed back into class based on this information that they had already had. They already had yeah. that drawing. They already knew about his search for ammunition. They knew that he was a danger. So the prosecutor will ultimately decide whether that's a level of negligence that is beyond ordinary negligence that would subject them to civil liability, whether it rises to the level of gross, wanton, willful criminal negligence that would subject them to those criminal penalties. The one thing the school didn't know is that, the, you know, mom and dad bought the 15-year-old a Sig Sauer just days beforehand. Real quickly, I want to play something this prosecutor said about all of these families. She says she's talked to the families of the victims about, you know, leveling these charges against the parents. This is what she had to say about that. Take a look. These people are in incredibly deep, horrific pain and grief. Um, their reaction is as you expect. They will want anyone who had the opportunity to stop this from happening to have done it. Well, uh, at this point, they can't even get their hands on those parents, Sheriff. Um, so this is a BOLO. I don't know if it's going to go on all weekend. There's a manhunt. It involves, you know, local police. Uh, it involves U.S. Marshals and the FBI. I keep thinking about a 15-year-old kid who is in lockup right now, who apparently doesn't know where his parents are either. There are no parents to look after that kid, visit that kid, adjudicate, help, meet with lawyers for that kid. What are they like what on earth could be going through the minds of parents who have a child who is likely going to spend the rest of his life in prison and needs them more today, tonight, this hour than ever before and they are their bolos. That's why we had this shooting because they abdicated their responsibility as parents. And now, obviously, what's more important, their freedom is more important than what they raised and taught to do this. And Ashley, I want to follow up on what, what Darren said. He's so correct. 
School boards around the country are paralyzed when these threats come in. They don't want law enforcement in schools. You have movements not to take action against these kids. They're idle threats. And now, like, like the prosecutor said, she had to look in the eyes of these families and, 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 and can't believe their loved ones are taken away. These parents, they're not parents. They're enablers, and here they are running for their lives now because they know what they raised wreaked havoc on that community. I guess they didn't want to spend the weekend in jail, uh, worried they might not be able to bail out. Hey, um, Sheriff Chitwood and Darren Kabanoki, just great to have you guys. I wish it were under different circumstances, but thank you for your wisdom. So appreciate it. Thanks, Ashley, and God bless those oh, families. It's good to see you, Ashley. God bless all those families, honestly. What they are going through right now, I, I can't even put myself in those shoes. It's just heartbreaking. You know, what we're seeing play out in Oxford, Michigan, is a first but is charging the parents for a school shooting a step towards prevention? Is it a step too far? We're gonna dig into that next. Parents punish their kids when they break the rules and governments punish parents when parents break the rules. But there's a whole lot less leeway and a whole lot more red tape when it comes to punishing parents. Today, a Michigan County prosecutor cut that tape and she brought down the hammer on the parents of the suspected gunman who allegedly shot to death four students and injured seven more people at his school. Joining me now is Mark Barden. He is the co-founder and CEO of Sandy Hook Promise. On December 14th, it'll be nine years since his seven-year-old son, Daniel, was killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut. Also with us is child and adolescent family therapist, Darby Fox. Welcome to both of you, and thank you so much for, for being here tonight on this story. And I should just remind parents that um, those two parents are still on the lam tonight. Uh, they were facing four counts of involuntary manslaughter, and they just didn't show up. Four o'clock today, so tick tock. They're still out there somewhere, and cops are looking for them. Darby, I'd like to start with you, and I want to play something that this prosecutor said today because she spoke not only as a prosecutor, as a civic leader, but also as a mother. That's not normal for prosecutors to do, but she had a reason. I want you to take a listen to this, and I'll ask you on the other side. Take a look. I have tremendous compassion and empathy for parents who have children who are struggling and at risk for whatever reason. And I am by no means saying that an active shooter situation should always result in a criminal prosecution against parents. But the facts of this case are so egregious. Reading this document, looking at it, reading the words, help me, with a gun, blood everywhere, this doesn't just have impact me as a prosecutor and a lawyer, it impacts me as a mother. The notion that a parent could read those words and also know that their son had access to a deadly weapon that they gave him is unconscionable and, it, and I think it's criminal. Darby, the words she said, I have tremendous compassion and empathy for parents who have children who are struggling. This alleged shooter had to have been struggling to have pulled something like this off, but it doesn't give them a pass if they knew the things they knew. Help me get around this because I am struggling with just processing what these parents knew and what this kid allegedly did. So actually, it's really hard to get around that. Um, those parents clearly knew that there were issues that were pretty severe with their child at school, whether it was bullying, he was being isolated, rejection of some sort. This never comes out of the blue completely. And the fact that they were duplicitous in getting him a gun. And then once you get into the school today where you see that or when it happened that morning and you see the note with help me with blood and a gun, I don't know anyone who wouldn't then say, we need to get this kid immediate help, not 48 hours, not after English class, right now, we need to help this child. So I, I, I don't know, Ashley, I can't, it's, it's beyond angry, it's incredibly sad. It, it's it's shocking. It's beyond comprehension it is what it is. And, and Mark Barton, I know that Sandy Hook Promise has made it the mission 
to help kids and parents understand red flags, understand what to look for, understand how to raise those red flags, how to deal with things, how to maybe offset behavior before it becomes deadly like this. But then you hear a story like this, and I can't imagine, if it feels like, it feels like a hundred steps backwards. Well, you know, you're, you're right about that, Ashley. And, and I'll just say off the top that my heart and my, my thoughts are with those families right now. Um, this is devastating and unreal. And an, uh, just I, my heart is with them, um, what, they're, what they're dealing with, because I've been living this for, as you say, uh, just about nine years now, uh, and it never gets any easier. Um, so, so I just want to get that out in the beginning. And, and yes, uh, thank you for acknowledging the work that we do at Sandy Hook Promise. Um, you know, there, we, we know from research that almost always there are warning signs. And if, if folks are trained on how to identify, recognize those warning signs, and then they have the tools to get that individual connected to the help that they need or whatever services uh, might help them through this, uh, we're, we're preventing tragedies uh, like this. We're preventing suicides, uh, other acts of violence, uh, just by teaching students how to know the signs, tell a trusted adult that could be a, a parent, a faith leader, a coach, uh, anybody in their network who can then uh, connect this individual to whatever supportive services they need uh, and, and get in front of this. And it's about prevention. And, and just a last comment, Darby, you know, there are a lot of kids who have uh, antisocial personalities. Uh, they, they come across as unusual or strange and they are not killers. How on earth are kids supposed to tell the difference and are teachers supposed to tell the difference? And for that matter, parents, how are they supposed to tell the difference? Well, I think the important thing here is we don't really know and we can't tell the difference. So what we wanna address is someone who is having severe trouble with making friends, with interacting socially. If, you're, if you think they're weird, then we need to tell somebody about that. And we need to teach our kids to be inclusive and be curious. Uh, as you know, was just mentioned, we need to take these warning signs and then do something about them. So there's not one school shooting that didn't have warning signs. There's not one. So I think we really have to act in advance. Sandy Hook, the child was very odd. He locked himself in his room. His mom bought him all kinds of ammunition. These things should not go unchecked. And I think we need to teach kids to reach out. They do know, they saw the social media. They have to reach out and say, this is a little dark or this is, this is scary. And as adults, yeah. it's our responsibility to then go ahead and act on that. Well, listen, Mark, I just wanted to tell you, um, I, I was there nine years ago, and it's hard to believe that it's only been nine years because it feels like yesterday for me, and I cannot imagine uh, what it feels like for you, especially as this anniversary comes up and then this story happens. So I just want to let you know, as you are magnanimous to those parents, I think the rest of us watching right now are very magnanimous towards you, and we want to just send you our love and prayers. Thank you, Ashley. That, that means a lot. I appreciate that. And let's 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 hope we don't continue meeting like this. Honestly, um, it's it's just awful. And and thank you to both of you. I really appreciate your wisdom tonight. Thanks, thank you. Ashley. Okay, I'm going to change direction um, because honestly, all day I've just been like drowning in this story and this sadness. And um, I had planned something very special for you tonight. And it was going to be a lot of the show, and it's going to be just a little bit less of the show, but it's going to be a big and important part of the show. And it's going to lighten your mood up this Friday night. After the break, you may have seen them on Instagram. You may have seen them on YouTube. You may have seen them on Ellen DeGeneres. They are the Clark family, and they are one of the biggest viral sensations out there right now. How did these three little cutie patooties and their dad strike a chord with audiences, old and young, playing songs from a time before even dad was born.
At the beginning of the pandemic, we all had grand plans of what we hoped to accomplish during the lockdown. We were going to be healthier, lose weight, be more creative, spend more time with our families. And most of us did none of the above, except this family did. And they just happened to throw in becoming rock stars as well. The Clark family in Tampa started a family band during lockdown, which turned into something of a music empire. And if you haven't seen these viral performances, here is dad, Colt Clark, and his three quarantine kids, 10-year-old Cash on the guitar, 8-year-old Beckett on the drums, and 6-year-old Bellamy. They're performing uh, the CCR hit, Fortunate Son. Take a look. video already has more than 100,000 views and tens of millions of people have visited their YouTube channel and their Instagram page. I am just one of them, but I am a regular. It is a great example of how parents and kids can spend quality time together and have a whole lot of fun doing it. And I'm so excited and, and thrilled to welcome, uh, you know, like you guys are like huge stars to me and you're on my show. This is great. Okay. Aubrey Clark is the mom. All right. You can see her over on the couch. And then Cole Clark is the dad in the back with the checkered shirt. Then Cash is the oldest son. He plays guitar. And Beckett, he's Hello. on the drums and he's awesome. And Bellamy, with the most spirit I have ever seen in a lead singer and a tambourine player and dancer and all the rest. Colt, you are so talented. Uh, and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But how did you get these three kids so interested and so good? Oh my goodness. Well, thank you. Thanks for having us on the show, Ashley. Um, uh, we, we've always had music playing in the house. I mean, whether it be on the radio or um, just me playing around the house. Uh, and, and the kids have gone to a lot of my gigs before COVID. They would, they would come and they would listen. And, um, and so when COVID happened and we were in lockdown, um, we started playing a little bit together. Now the kids had been playing, the boys had been playing for about a year on their instruments and just starting to get more comfortable and more comfortable. And we were playing a song a night um, just as our regular routine. And we had such a good time doing that, that, that Aubrey had the idea to, to make a video of us playing these songs um, and send them to some family and, and some friends. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, yeah, the family and friends got big real fast. Aubrey, you're usually behind the camera <laughs> shooting these scenes. I don't know how you keep a straight yes. face with Bellamy in the front like this. And what's <laughs> hilarious is watching Cash on the guitar. He watches his sister as he taps his bare foot, and he laughs at his sister. <laughs> and then Beckett's over there keeping perfect time. Aubrey, are you shocked at, like, at how good these kids are. Like, they're really good musicians. It is, it is crazy. We knew kind of at the beginning of pandemic, they started playing, they were playing together a little bit, and we kind of knew they had something going, and it was just fun. But we never imagined that they would progress this fast and that they would be this tight of a band. I mean, it was, it's still shocking to me every time we do a song, and we, we plan time to be able to film these songs. And sometimes we get in here, we sit down at the instruments, they do it in one take and we're done. It's just like three minutes and we're done. It's just shocking that they just get, they're so, they're so tight as a band. They work so well together. They are really tight. So Cash, just real quickly, I see you having such a good time on the guitar. You, you always laugh at your sister, but are you like a rock star <laughs> now? Uh, like among your, your, eight, your, or your, your <laughs> friends are probably all what, 10, I guess. Are you like a, a big star? Well, yeah, some of them like <laughs> Come, come, some of them come up to me and say like, like you're so good or something like that. But like I don't really. He's got he's got a yeah. little. Uh, he and Beckett both have a little band 
of uh, guys from church that we play with, and they come over and they rehearse. They're called Fender Bender, and that's their side <laughs> oh project. <my> but uh, <laughs> oh, and, 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 and all, yeah, they even have T-shirts. What you just did, flipping the sticks, pretty impressive. Okay, I want to play a song, and then I'm going to come back and ask you guys a couple questions about some really famous people who okay. all of a sudden uh, have gotten up in your grill and want to play with you and are like putting you on their Instagram. So, okay, real quickly, this song is which one are we playing? guys uh, tell me real quickly which one running on empty okay so we're gonna play that out and then I'm gonna ask you questions on the other side of the break sure okay hey everybody welcome to our band we're going to sing running on empty and take it easy one two three four running on empty and take it easy one two Uh, back with the Clark family. All right, so Colt, the big question, other than what is the name of the teddy bear on Beckett's drum kit? First, that's the question I have to okay. get answered. <laughs> okay, so we're big Tampa Bay Lightning fans, the hockey team. They won two Stanley Cups in a row. So this is Ooh. Thunderbug, the mascot for the Lightning. So now everybody can stop it. asking on Facebook and, <laughs> and Instagram. There you go. Beckett, hit your drum. Hit, if you, can you hit the drum so we can see how thunder oh. uh, it moves every time you... Uh... The kick. The kick drum. Yeah. The... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Every single time I watch your videos, I watch that little um, teddy bear, you know, flipping around. It's so cute. Okay. But the big question is, Colt, these kids seem to be into music that is older than even your generation. How did you get them to like this music? Well, it's pretty easy to like. I mean, that I, I'm biased, but I think that was the best uh, generation of music, the 60s and 70s. Um, that was real rock and roll. That was we, real guitars, real drums, real keyboards, real piano, and no auto-tune. <laughs> and it was just honest. It was honest music, and it was wholesome and, and good. And uh, that's that's what my parents uh, brought me up on, and Aubrey's it's what, parents. Yeah, it's what we listen to. And it's what we, we listen to in the truck right. when we're driving around and stuff. Yeah. It's me too. Bellamy, okay. do you do you love that music, or do you have other music when you're not performing, Bellamy, that you like to listen to? Well, I love the music that we listen to in the truck, and I also do love those um, music You like Christmas too. music? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You do like? Do you like any other like uh, music that say maybe your friends like, like Billie Eilish or Jessica Simpson or anything like that? Uh, Who do you like? Maybe Billie Eilish or rap or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's new to me. <laughs> and, and then Beckett. Um, Beckett, you've had some super famous people who have like started looking at your Instagram. Um, Alec Baldwin is starting to repost your stuff. Mickey Dolans from the Monkees uh, sent you guys some 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 treats. Ellen DeGeneres had you on the show. Was that all pretty uh, pretty amazing, or just you know part of the normal uh, process for a big rock star? 
Yeah, uh, it was it was really fun. I didn't <laughs> think we would be on Ellen ever. <laughs> And there you were. Okay, we're gonna play another song. This is one of my favorites, and it's why I asked your mom if she could uh, definitely isolate this song for. for okay, we're gonna show <laughs> the thunder uh, clapping away. <laughs> this one's Lowrider. So we're gonna play this one, and I got a few more questions for you after we play Lowrider. Back with the Clarks. Take a look. Hey, everybody, we're all Clark Billy. We're going to sing Lowrider. with the uh, Clark family. And by the way, you guys are no joke. You went to the uh, the Marty Stewart concert, and he had you guys up on stage performing, and I watched it, and it was like, it was as though it was all adults up there. It was fantastic. Quick question for you, Cash. You ready? I watch you as you've got your, usually barefoot, tapping away as you're playing the guitar. You play bass. <laughs> You play electric guitar, you play uh, acoustic guitar, but most of the time you just laugh at Bellamy's dancing. And I'm not sure if it's Fortnite dancing or if it's the Mick Jagger strut, but you seem to find your sister very funny. <laughs> oh yeah, she's normally doing that around the house too. She's just doing dance tutorials on the TV. Just hogging up the TV, doing just... <laughs> That is Bellamy, that yeah. is who she is. She's like that in front of the camera, she's like that in the living room. She's like that before bed. Yeah. <laughs> I woke up upstairs. Are you like guys that. gonna do any original stuff? Do you think? Hey, Colt, real quickly, do you think you're gonna write your own songs and be able to perform out there in the the real world? Oh man, that would be cool. I mean, we 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 play a little bit here and there about maybe toying with the idea of of writing some original material. I've I've got some original stuff that I've written before they were even born, so it'd be kind of cool to resurrect that stuff. So maybe we'll see. It's kind I mean, of cool. Some of the stuff that he wrote um, and that he it. has on his album, he was in the studio with us recording it when he was a tiny tiny baby. Yeah. So and now he's playing. All right, well we're playing. gonna you know what we're gonna do we're gonna play you guys out to um, Paul McCartney's wonderful Christmas time and I wanna have you guys back on the show at some point in the future. Thank you for doing this and I love you to bits. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so, Thank you so much. much. Merry Thank Christmas. You. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Christmas time. One, two, three, four. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.